Bienvenidos, soy Patricia Gómez. Hoy en adelante nos unimos al especial de salud mental de Milwaukee PBS y conversamos con Teodolo de la Garza, un terapista de Milwaukee LGBT Community Center. También conversamos con José Elías García Joven, doctor en matemáticas, y el doctor Tony Baez, un activista en educación, y les preguntamos sobre la falta de maestros que se está agudizando. Margarita Meléndez, del Departamento de Educación de los Estados Unidos, visita MITC. Una historia más de Sueños Americanos por Mariano Ávila. La pandemia de COVID-19 ha contribuido en la crisis de salud mental. Hoy conversamos con el terapista Teodolo de la Garza, quien tiene una historia personal de resiliencia que le ha ayudado a servir mejor a una comunidad frágil en el Milwaukee LGBT Community Center. Uh, my name is Teodolo de la Garza, and I am the AODA therapist, assistant clinical monitor, and volunteer assistant. One of the focus areas that I do work in is providing AODA therapy. The other one is advocating for victims of crime, victims of violence, domestic violence, incarceration, harassment, bullying, assault, etc. I provide recovery coaching and facilitate a recovery coaching curriculum here at the Milwaukee LGBT Center. You are a miracle, you are a survivor. Can you tell us, can you share with us uh, how come you have uh, become the strong uh, consular, therapist, coach that you are now? My personal story of incarceration is where it all started from. Um, I didn't think that I really had a story, to be honest, you know, I, I had all this drug addiction, the battle with clinical stage three depression at the age of 13, suicide attempts, three to be exact, one at 13, 14, and 17. Um, I self-medicated for about 17 years. Um, in those 17 years, I had a lot of bottled up anger, resentment, retaliation. I was involved with male prostitution, gang affiliation. Um, The cycle of insanity to believe that what was right was wrong in my state of mind. Having gone through the physical, the mental, the emotional, and sexual and spiritual abuse, that led me down a spiral effect of shame and regret. In that experience, going into the prison system, I, I had the fortunate opportunity to uh, apply myself with uh, self-help support groups, uh, life skill groups, Uh, prison ministry um, and mental health social workers who actually gave me uh, the assistance that I needed uh, in order for me to cope uh, within the environment that I was in in prison and also to be able to utilize uh, those skill sets in prison and then carry them out. That's like my past, right? But what led me to the field of human services? I uh, After I got out of prison, I went to MATC for a short period of time. Um, shortly after that, I explored Springfield College and earned an undergrad degree in addiction studies. And then I went on to uh, a master's degree in human services with a concentration in clinical mental health counseling. In those eight years working in the clinical field, I just thought to myself over a period of time of how can I be more effective with clients I pursued the master's in business because I wanted to learn how to sustain programming in the clinical field. I was fortunate and I was entrusted to be able to work with clients with a similar background as mine. I really wanted to find a way to help others really come out of where not only where I was at, but also to help them identify a new way to live. Uh, many times parents 
get lost in their efforts to help their kids? What kind of ideas can help them to get the kids out of the difficult situations that they are facing? By observing and watching their child's uh, behavior changes, uh, keeping communication open and honest with them. You want to be firm, but you also want to be gentle as possible. Uh, blaming could definitely cause an individual to isolate or shut down or feel not heard. And typically when youth are felt that way, then there's zero communication. Create a routine and set clear boundaries at home and open communication, family weekends or family week or uh, a family meeting or open discussion for a family meeting. Um, make it fun where uh, individuals or uh, children want to be able to be themselves in the presence of parents. Let them know that they are loved and supported. Sometimes easy to, to say you love them, but you might want to share that more than once throughout the day. Provide positive feedback and encouragement um, at the most littlest things. Um, youth at a very young age, they can sense disconnection. They can sense uh, neglect. They can sense uh, sadness. They can sense all these things that adults may not be fully aware that they can gravitate to. How can we contribute to a more um, mentally uh, healthy environment for uh, those uh, who surround us, our co-workers, our relatives, our kids? Um, and when, when we really think about that, it's about caring and nurturing. Be very caring and nurturing. Um, provide structure, boundaries, and guidance. Um, guidance is so crucial. That's It's like that word integrity, right? Doing the right thing when no one is looking. It's the same thing with the child, even though they may not be around. What if they might be around and they see you do something that you didn't think they, they seen. So that part has a lot to do with guidance. Uh, another one is respect a child as a person. They have a voice too. They have feelings, they have thoughts. Enable child empowerment. I know this all sounds like I just repeated this, but this is another uh, area that that is less talked about and most important to youth or building our uh, uh, stronger next generation. It's empowering, motivating, and listening, active listening. Sometimes it's not just about what we hear them not saying. Sometimes it's just about allowing the child to be a child. José Elías García Joven trabajó como maestro de matemáticas en las escuelas públicas de Milwaukee por 11 años. Posteriormente terminó su doctorado y ahora se desempeña como especialista en currículum en el departamento académico. Yo he conocido a José Elías por muchos años. Él nos da su punto de vista sobre la falta de maestros que continúa agudizándose. You never know what you're going to experience in the classroom until you are in front of those kids, so you learn so much from them. You become not only their teachers, but you advocate, your advisors, uh, your nurses, your parents. But I realized that sometimes you have to connect with the kids in a meaningful and valuable way so you can understand where they're coming from uh, if you want to actually teach them the content. It's not something new. We're facing a shortage of teachers, especially in the area of mathematics and, and, and science. Uh, I think there are many research showing, not only due to the pandemic, but even in the past, prior to the pandemic, that we always need teachers in, in the area of mathematics. El doctor Tony Baez fue parte de la mesa directiva de MPS. Su trayectoria en educación bilingüe incluye disertaciones sobre la educación en los Estados Unidos, en muchas partes de América Latina, y se destaca por su búsqueda de legislaciones que favorezcan una educación para la justicia social y la democracia. Ha sido galardonado en los más importantes forums de la educación. Well, I have been involved with educational matters for the past 50 years. Um, I have been involved with the the establishment of bilingual education, bilingual programs, but I don't want to be just thought of as somebody who's only involved in language education. I have been involved in pedagogy in general. 
the shortage of teachers corresponds to working condition. It corresponds to societal situations. It's pre the pandemic. This is not new. The pandemic just brought forth a lot of what we knew. Teachers are not appreciated in this society. The salaries are not high enough. Uh, there are some benefits that come with it, but it's still not enough by comparison with, with other workers in the society. And teachers are constantly being attacked, coupled with the fact that more teachers are feeling the pain of what's going on and they're leaving the profession. Now, all of that affects bilingual education. Latinos in this country are very diverse. The refugee population is very diverse. In some districts, there are more than 300 different language groups. And in this, just in Milwaukee Public Schools, there were over 80 language groups. Well, in the case of bilingual teachers, I think there is an ads on, like they have an ads on license, they have also an ads on issue, or not issue, but a responsibility that they have to face to become a licensed teacher and to uh, stay in the system. We have to be able to create different pathways. I don't know if there is a way in our educational system where those teachers can be licensed and we can retain those teachers. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have even more shortest teachers in the area of uh, bilingual, especially in the area of mathematics. The working conditions need to be uh, accommodated for teachers that are coming to the system, where we welcome them, where there is actually a classroom that they can feel they can own it and, and use it for creating that intellectual environment or educational environment in, in the classroom. The other reason we have a problem in many of our schools is that there is an incompatibility between the people that teach and the populations that are growing in those schools. The other way for the future is getting kids that are in high school now uh, to become involved, engaged in the idea that they can become good teachers. But why would kids want to be good teachers when they're seeing their teachers struggling? Make kids have fun learning, and then they go into the other stuff. And I suggest to the people that are making policy to make it much better for teachers to become good teachers and enjoy what they're doing and enjoy going to work and schools that really love kids. So every high school is not the same in Milwaukee. How do we promote equity in our system? Will we provide those essential and math teachers who are licensed in the areas that need the most? You have a case in process, um, a lawsuit against MPS. Uh, can you tell us what is the status of this case? Um, but this is a, a very difficult topic to talk about uh, for me since it involves some emotions and hurtful feelings, but I will try my best. Um, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to be an educator and, and choosing that as my career and my journey. I've been in the classroom for about 11 years and 15 years in total in education. Um, during those years, I was able to finish my two master's degree in education and mathematics and, and a doctoral degree in also in education with a focus in, in teaching and learning mathematics. So that was my area of expertise. So for that reason, I decided to pursue another uh, jobs that will actually impact the district or our students in Milwaukee Public School at a bigger scale. Um, it's very challenging and difficult when you see that they treat you different. And in this case, is disappointed when um, they criticize the essence of who you are, how you stand, how you talk. Um, for that reason, I decided to file an internal complaint uh, with the district and eventually uh, another uh, complaint with the state through the Department of um, the Equal Rights Division. The case stayed for uh, under investigation uh, for more than a year, and eventually they 
uh, determined that there was probable cause that I was totally different, um, that I was harassed at work, I was discriminated, I was bullied based on my race and my gender and national origin. So it, it was very challenging and hurtful. MITC continúa en su tarea por llegar a ser una institución de servicio a los hispanos. El pasado 20 de abril llevó a cabo un evento. Nosotros conversamos con la presentadora oficial Margarita Meléndez y con Arlene Siu García Novelli, quien es MITC HSI Leayeso. I am excited to share with you, all of you, in the upcoming sessions resources on HSIs and other minority serving institutions, MSIs, and how you can leverage the benefits of earning HSI status to further serve your students, faculty, and staff, and your community. I remember when we started talking about HSI, I attended uh, Dr. Gina Garcia's um, workshop. Before then, I really didn't understand the whole HSI thing. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, but after that workshop, I was like, yes, like, I'm, I'm going for this. this. This is like, this speaks of my people. This really talks even about myself, like my own experience as a college student. I was like, I'm living this room and I'm going to do something to really make a difference. And here I am. So it worked. So what I want you guys to do today is the same thing, to come here, learn, but also take that to the next level. Uh, today is a great opportunity for all of us to truly and authentically reflect about the way we want to move our Latino, Latinx student population forward at MATC and other institutions because we cannot continue to do what we've been doing before. Y el HSI es una designación que otorga el Departamento de Educación de los Estados Unidos y significa ser una institución que sirve a los hispanos. HSIs and other MSI programs, as I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, strengthen institutions that serve Hispanic, Black, Native American, Asian American, and other minority and low-income students. These programs provide financial assistance to help institutions solve problems, their ability to survive, to improve their management and fiscal operations and to build endowments. Um, what are our future plans? We want to continue to collaborate with all our stakeholders, our partners, um, you know, our friends from Gateway. We can't do this alone. We need everyone uh, to support what we're doing. When we talk about HSI, it's not just about specific institutions. It's about a collective movement to get our Hispanic community forward, to move us forward as a community, to move Hispanic student success forward as a collective in, in Milwaukee area, in Wisconsin, and within the nation. So the Hispanic Serving Institutions Division is part of the Office of Post-Secondary Education in the U.S. Department of Education, and we provide discretionary grant programs. According to the latest data from the 2020-2021 academic year, there are currently 559 HSIs across our great nation, as well as 393 emerging HSIs, of which MATC is proudly one of them. Nosotros comenzamos en octubre del 2019, fue cuando se anunció MATC se va a postular para trabajar uh, en pro de convertirse en una institución HSI. Y para eso hicimos un gran evento, invitamos a la comunidad, a, a todas las personas que están conectadas con MTC y fue algo que, que transformó a, a MTC internamente. Eh, se comenzaron a, a, a ofrecer más posiciones bilingües. There are some new bilingual programs uh, that are either in the works, almost wrapping up, um, and so in each pathway, we, uh, our focus really was to not just the courses, but also looking at programs. And how do you become designated as an HSI? It's a threefold process. The most important one is 
to have a 25% undergraduate full-time equivalent enrollment of Hispanic students. So that is the baseline. And we, ha we still have ways to go when it comes to justice, when it comes to equity, when it comes to diversity and inclusion for our Latinx community. The other two parts of that um, designation are having a high percentage of needy students and having low education general expenditures at the institutional level. MACC garantiza una educación económica para aquellos que quieren algo a, a, a corto plazo, pero que hay tanta demanda laboral que a veces son más los trabajos que tienen nuestros estudiantes después de graduarse que el número de estudiantes en ese programa. Y, y MHC tiene 170 programas diferentes y la demanda laboral es increíble. Pero MHC también sirve como un puente entre la educación de dos años y la educación de cuatro años. MHC tiene actualmente acuerdos con más de 40 universidades de cuatro años que están esperando que los estudiantes de MHC se vayan con ellos para poder terminar lo que es el bachelor degree o el, o el, o el diploma de cuatro años. We want to shift our focus to the Latino culture. Um, because I, I know that I've talked about our bilingual programs, our Spanish, English, not all of our students are bilingual who are Hispanic, right? Um, however, the demographic component of the eligibility designation, which is 25% undergraduate Hispanic student enrollment, that is never waived. So that's something that is, is non-negotiable, but you can request a waiver for the low educational expenditures or for the high percentage of needy students, especially if you're near the cutoff. When we think about the retention rates and the enrollment rates of Hispanic students, it's not just about, again, the number. It's about the whole person that comes to our institution. It's about who they are, their identity. It's about their language. And one of the things that we found is that we needed to create a peer support system. Necesitamos mucho entrenamiento. Entrenarnos para que podamos realmente entender el por qué Queremos ser HSI, ¿por qué nuestros estudiantes necesitan que nosotros trabajemos más para ellos? I think together we are going to continue to move the needle, but again, it's not in a silo. We have to do it collectively in the state of Wisconsin. And if we can recruit and retain our Hispanic student population, we're winning. Entonces la educación va a jugar un papel muy importante en que nosotros nos convirtamos en esa minoría que es educada en esa minoría que va a estar en puestos políticos y en esa minoría que va a ser los, los líderes de las grandes corporaciones. These grants are transformation to bring about system-wide change at schools as they serve students, their families, and their communities. Y ahora un reportaje más de Sueños Americanos, una serie presentada por Mariano Ávila, productor bilingüe de Milwaukee PBS. Hola, mi nombre es Jean Carlos Alemán Tenorio. Yo enseño a los niños a, a manejar la, la bicicleta en, en la carril o en la calle. Mi mamá nació en Veracruz, en México. Yo nací en Ciudad Juárez. Mi mamá cruzó la frontera el año siguiente cuando nací. Milwaukee es mi lugar, lugar que crecí y siento como es casa. Y todo empezó desde el no, nuevo grado. Pregunté a mi maestra, ¿y ¿hay algo que yo pueda hacer durante el verano? Porque yo no quiero estar uh, en la casa aburrido, haciendo nada. Yo no quiero ser esos tipos de niños <ríe> que no hacen nada, que se quedan allí. Entonces ella me pasó el boletín diciendo, necesitaba a alguien o una asistencia de mecánico de bicicleta. Desde allí hice reparación de bicicleta en seis o siete años. El año pasado me movieron hasta el instructor de Bike and Safety Walk. Desde ahí nunca miré atrás. Me encanta, los niños son rebeldes a veces, pero con tanta energía, pues cada vez que enseñamos, um, vamos a enseñar, tienen su cara de sonriente, emocionados, que quieren aprender, aunque no ponen atención, pero son niños. Desde allí le enseñamos cómo se llama cada parte de la bicicleta. Le enseñamos en rutas. Tenemos como un curso en el, en el pavimento. Le enseñamos las señales. Como nosotros no tenemos luces en nuestras bicicletas, 
que enseña dónde vamos a ir, enseñamos a los niños a usar las manos, a doblar y parar y mirar atrás. Bueno, mi sueño americano es dar algo a la comunidad y sable de dinero, tener una casa, carro, para no te preocuparme, oh, listo de dinero, que, que, que otro. Quiero dar algo para mi mamá también, que ella me trajo aquí desde el bebé. En el futuro, algo que puede ayudarme es la citizenship, sentir orgullo lo que estás haciendo y yo amo lo, la cosa que estoy haciendo. Y con un hasta pronto nos despedimos, invitándolos a que nos dejen saber sus comentarios por el teléfono 414-297-7544 o en nuestro correo electrónico. Visite nuestro sitio del internet en Milwaukee PBS ORG y en Facebook. Soy Patricia Gómez, deseándoles paz y bendiciones. Mm -hmm.